It's a, a delight for me to be here. My name is Julia Hanigsberg. I think I know, I, I can't imagine there's anyone in this room I don't know, but who knows? I'm the president and CEO here at Holland Blurview. And uh, Teaching and Learning Day is always one of the, the great days in our calendar here at Holland Bloorview. I was uh, talking to one of my colleague CEOs from another academic health science center here in Toronto, and I mentioned that I couldn't be at a meeting this morning that he was chairing, and uh, he emailed back and said, oh, you're so lucky. Those are always my favorite days. So uh, I'm with him. This is one of my favorite days. I want to start off by acknowledging that we have the great uh, delight and joy of being able to teach and learn here on territories that have been in continuous op occupation for thousands of years, most recently treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. Why do we acknowledge land uh, when we come together in this way? We do it as an act of reconciliation, in acknowledgement of hundreds and hundreds of years of activities, activities of colonizers and settlers that didn't fully acknowledge and didn't understand and didn't properly uh, care for and steward uh, lands that we come to as settlers, um, as new arrivals in a long, long history. Uh, we do this as an act of reconciliation with our Indigenous colleagues and friends and partners, Inuit, Métis and First Nations. Um, so today is all about teaching and learning, of course, and the buzz in this room and the energy speaks to how deep and important this is. I like the kind of cool jazz behind me. I don't <laughs> generally get to, uh, to speak with that kind of background, so I'm feeling good about that. If I do a bit of swaying, you'll know uh, that it's impacting me. Um, you know, you're all here because of how deeply you value uh, the teaching and learning, the academic mission that we embrace here at Holland Blue Review. So often we talk about the fact that we are a relatively young academic institution. So we talk about the fact in research that we, our research institute is about 14 years old. Our full academic affiliation with the University of Toronto is from that era. And sometimes we say, oh, we're, you know, we're 14, we're a gnarly teenager in academic terms. But our history as a teaching hospital goes far back before that, of course. Um, I am, and, and perhaps more than anybody else in this building, very excited about the fact that it's our 120th birthday this year. Um, and I'm fascinated by our long history, our, the 18 women who came together in 1899, uh, knowing that as a um, partner and a complement to the hospital for sick children, there needed to be a place where what they called then incurable children. Uh, would have their home and have high quality care and be taken care of. And those 18 women came together and formed that original, that original organization, which over time and, and, uh, and different structures uh, we have here today with us as Holland Bloorview, uh, where we are deeply committed to the lives of children, as our vision says, to the most meaningful and healthy futures for all children, youth, and families. But back way into our history, um, in that teaching has always been a part of what we cared about. So in the 50s and 60s, practical on-site training became a standard for both um, University of Toronto's occupational and physical therapy. The Nightingale School of Nursing, as it then was, long, long part of the then Bloorview Children's Hospital history. So teaching and learning, the thing about which you all have a great passion, is deeply embedded in who we are, and it speaks to why you're here, and is that legacy of leadership that we both celebrate today and deepen and advance. Um, helping to build, advance our capacity across health education and community and social services sectors related to pediatric disability, medical complexity, chronic conditions in children, um, allow us to advance uh, the lives of those families who mean so much to us. And that's why I want to point out um, what a great job the Teaching and Learning Institute does and uh, this day does in incorporating and co-designing with our family leaders and how important it is and how delighted I am to see family leaders and, and people who are closest to the experience of, of uh, the care of children, the lives of children. As we know, we have uh, a role that is important and about which we're incredibly proud in the lives of children. But families, caregivers, these are the people who day in and day out, 24 hours a day, are the experts in their children, their children's lives. And partnering with them to make a difference in those lives is what brings us back uh, here every single day. 
Uh, it's great to see so many of you here from so many different parts across the hospital. It's a day when, you know, often we are in our day jobs, we are working hard, you are in clinic, you are in the environments in which you're making a difference every single day. There are few times where we all get to come together and to share our learnings and share our thinking, and this is one of them, and for that, I think we are all very grateful. Again, I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to Teaching and Learning Day. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you to share your learnings today on social media with a hashtag uh, TLI Day. Yes, I'm getting nods. Thank you very much. Um, you know I'll be doing that. So if you're lazy, you can just retweet me. <laughs> and uh, I want to now turn it over to our Vice President of Medicine and Academic Affairs, Dr. Golda Milo Manson, to introduce our keynote. I prefer James Taylor, so if you want to put James Taylor on, that would be okay. I'll just turn that off for you. I think Diane Savage, if she's here, she's the jazz uh, fan in our uh, in our mix. Uh, there we go. Uh, okay, good. I'll just bring this up over here too. Thank you. Anyways, I also just want to welcome everybody and thank you all for coming. Um, this is a favorite of mine. Um, as Julia said, a favorite of so many of us, and not just because there are lattes in the lobby. Um, I want you to know I've tried to get it into the operating budget every year. I don't know, Julia nixes it. Um, but uh, at least we have it on Teaching and Learning Day. It's, uh, it's a very special treat. Um, the committee worked so hard to plan for today, and by the end of the day, you will see why it takes so much time. But Darlene, I, you know, she turned off the jazz, but please stand up again, because you. <laughs> you really lead a wonderful team of hardworking staff and families um, who really work together to bring this wonderful program to us. Um, being a U of T Academic Health Science Center, we know that teaching and learning is central to everything we do. We are so fortunate to have often the cream of the crop of students that come into our building, and we have an opportunity with every trainee, every student, um, every postdoc, to make everybody who comes in our building an advocate for childhood disabilities. So not only do we have the opportunity to teach to learn, but we also have an opportunity to turn these young people into advocates for childhood disability. So we really have a double honor. Um, and today we have an amazing guest speaker um, who I am so proud to be able to introduce, uh, Dr. Zubin Austin. Um, he is currently the professor and Murray Koffler Chair in Pharmacy Management. He's an award-winning educator and researcher, and you're about to see and hear why we are so lucky to have him. He's known for his work in improving the quality of teaching at the undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate levels in the pharmacy community. Dr. Austin helps to develop programs that advance the quality of clinical teaching for pharmacy students that improves patient care. And this is where you will all be humbled. He has received the Association of Faculties of Pharmacy Canada Bristol Meyer Squibb Excellence in Pharmacy Education Award, the Government of Ontario's Leadership in Faculty Teaching Award, the Faculty of Pharmacy's Teaching of the Year Award on seven occasions. He is the only University of Toronto professor to have received both the President's Teaching Award for Excellence as an Educator and the President's Research Impact Award for societal significance of his research. He's also been named the Undergraduate Professor of the Year by students on 18 separate occasions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mack. is that I'm old, that's all it means. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for coming today and it's wonderful to see a group of people who are willing to take a day out of their busy lives to think about what it means to be a better teacher. Because of course what you do is absolutely crucial 
not just for the institution, but for the future. And that's kind of dramatic, but it's actually kind of true. Because your ability to instill your profession's ethos, your values, your ethics, as well as the technical skills that all of you transmit to the next generation, all of that is absolutely crucial. I began my, uh, my professional life initially as a pharmacist, and I'm still a practicing pharmacist. There's a joke we tell about pharmacists, and that is, what do pharmacists use for contraception? And the answer is their personalities. <laughs> Sorry, Amy. <laughs> but hopefully today we can move beyond that and think a little bit more about the, what we all have in common here as teachers. So what we're going to be doing over the next, oh, turning, it, turn, turning this on. What we're going to be doing over the next uh, hour or so is listed on this slide. For those of you that like learning objectives, and as you will see shortly, some of you do and some of you couldn't care less, what we're going to be talking about are some major psychological theories of teaching and learning. Think about how that actually applies when we talk about something called pedagogy, the science of teaching. Focus on a specific theory, learning styles theory, but most importantly, what I hope you'll get out of today is an opportunity to reflect upon your own teaching and learning style and how that fundamentally shapes your practice as an educator. So to begin with, what I'd like you to do is think about the best teacher you ever had. It probably wasn't somebody that was in a formal educational setting like university. It might have been a primary school teacher. It might have been a piano teacher. Somebody who taught you how to skate. Somebody who taught you how to sort your laundry or, uh, or cook. But think about the best teacher the most impactful and memorable teacher you've ever had, and think about some words you would use to describe that person. What are some adjectives that you would use to describe the best teacher you ever had? It's kind of nice because when I asked that question, a whole bunch of you went, aww. <laughs> you got all sort of fuzzy in your tummy when I asked that question. Uh, what are some words you would use to describe the best teacher you ever had? Adaptable. Passionate, adaptable. Patient. Patient. Compassionate. Compassionate. Honest. So there's five or six words there. And conspicuously absent from that list was smart, knowledgeable, or subject matter expert. Of course, when we as teachers think about our role, sometimes we can overestimate the importance of expertise in what makes us successful. That's not to say that you can be any old Joe and be a great teacher. But the extent to which what makes for impactful, memorable teachers are things like passion, adaptability, honesty, flexibility, concern, care, all of those things. That's a useful place to start when we think about what makes for good quality teaching. And so as the second place to go to, what I'd like you to do now is just chat amongst yourselves at your tables and answer a question that should be top of mind for anybody who is an educator. How do you know when you have actually learned something? What are the signals or cues that you respond to that tell you, yup, I've learned something? Talk amongst yourselves and try to answer that question. Go. wind up your conversations. If I, if I could ask you to please wind down your conversations. In overhearing, con or just overhearing what people were saying, so far my favorite answer is somebody said, oh, how do I know I've learned something? Well, a light bulb appears over my head. <laughs> That's how I know. 
But in, in all seriousness, because as educators, we are interested in our own learning, but we're also very interested in the learning of the people that we are supervising. So how do we know when we have learned something? What are some of the th answers you came up with at your table that don't involve light bulbs magically appearing? <laughs> Any thoughts? Okay, so being able to apply something in a new or different situation. Any other thoughts? Yes. Okay, so if it's something new, I feel the urge to tell somebody about it because it's so interesting or new or cool. Great. I think on this side was yes. Totally subjective response, mm -hmm. but my Confidence, a subjective response. I feel, oh, I got this. I can cover this. If you had a hard time with this question, don't feel badly because it's actually a trick question. <laughs> it seems odd that something as straightforward as how do you know that you've learned something is a question that psychologists at least have absolutely no answer to. There are so many answers to this question and this in some ways starts to become a bit of an issue but also an opportunity for us about the only thing that psychologists can actually agree upon about learning is that somehow it's connected to memory. That memory is needed for learning. What we know in a very, and this is a very superficial explanation, what we know about memory is that conveniently we can divide memory into three kinds of bins. Working memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Of course, working memory is that memory that allows us to interact with our world. Working memory is the memory that we see when we ask somebody a question. The capacity of working memory is really small, maybe about seven to eight characters. The time duration of working memory is also fleeting, maybe about five to 10 seconds. So if I were to tell you that my office phone number was 416-978-0186, It's amazing how long a second is in a situation like this. <laughs> Does anybody know my office phone number? She gets lunch first. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> One of the reasons why, if you did remember that number, other than the fact that clearly you're a bloody genius, um, <laughs> is because for many of us in the GTA, we've learned a very important trick with phone numbers you didn't actually need to remember 416. You did something called chunking. If I was from Vancouver, I don't even know what the area code is, and I gave you a random area code, suddenly your ability to remember a phone number is going to be much more challenging. One of the issues, of course, with working memory is that what you just demonstrated is sometimes what happens when you ask a student something like, tell me, what's the mechanism of action of the drug flecainide? And they say something and you go, oh, you must have learned that. Who remembers my phone number now? <laughs> why, are all, why are all those people at this table? You, you, keep, you keep them here just to contain them a little bit? Yeah, okay, fair enough. The point, of course, of all of this is that when we rely on a simple flash of regurgitation as something that allows us to believe we've confirmed a student's learning, have we actually done that? Because of working memory's duration and its capacity, it typically isn't the kind of learning that we're all trying to achieve. The next layer of learning is short term, uh, of memory is short term memory. And short term memory has a duration of about three hours and a capacity of about three to five pages of information. What event in human life <laughs> takes about three hours? and requires you to know about three to five pages worth of information. The university exam. <laughs> Once again, it's the sort of thing that if we rely on an indicator such as that to say that learning has occurred, perhaps we're in trouble. Let me give you an example. I'll put my money where my mouth is. I have $20 for anybody who can come up right now and draw a Krebs cycle for me. Oh, then I've got $50 for anybody who can, uh, 
Now, in all seriousness, you're all healthcare professionals. Every healthcare professional at some point has taken a biochemistry course. All of you recognized Krebs cycle. No doubt some of you got an A in your biochemistry course, and there's not a single healthcare professional alive who knows anything about Krebs cycle other than there's a circle and a nad pho somewhere <laughs> along the way. <laughs> the point is, though, your university certified that you learned this. How much else did you learn in university <laughs> that you actually clearly didn't? When most of us think about the word learning, what we really think about is what goes into long-term memory. And long-term memory is that memory that allows you to remember your childhood phone number. You still remember my office phone number? You keep an eye on her. <laughs> It's what allows you to remember a small facial characteristic of your best friend when you were th in grade two. Long-term memory is that deep, sustainable, longitudinal memory that theoretically at least, and in the absence of any organic issues, has an almost unlimited capacity and a duration that will last you your life. When we think about learning, that's the learning we really want to achieve. The learning where deep inside, if I say, what's seven times seven, you just know it. It's just there. Instead of then asking the question, how do you know that you've learned something, the question perhaps educators should be asking is how do we motivate, incentivize, or encourage our learners to want to put something into long-term memory? Because as the example of Krebs cycle perhaps suggests, your students are making a lot of choices every minute they spend with you. Do I listen to this? Do I just say, yeah, you want me to jump through a hoop? Sure, I'll jump through a hoop and tell you whatever you want. If we really are interested in improving the quality of learning, what we need to think about is what does it take to get students to want to put things into long-term memory. Psychologists have coined the term learnworthiness to describe the process by which learners make conscious and subconscious decisions on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to decide, yep, this is worth putting into long-term memory. No, this is just going into short-term memory, so in case somebody randomly asks me a question, I'll be able to vomit it out at an appropriate point. Most of the things we do as teachers, by using techniques like rewards and punishments as our main way of incentivizing learning, probably drive people to want to put things into working or short-term memory. I love biochemistry. Yeah, I'm going to get an A in biochemistry. And then the minute the biochemistry exam is over, what? Yeah, I'm moving on from there. We need to think about strategies to help incentivize and get students to, un to want to put things into long-term memory. And this, then, is where the idea of learning styles theory comes from. Learning styles theory really focuses on the notion that individuals have different preferences when it comes to interacting with their world. Learning styles theory can probably be tracked back, at least initially, to some of the pioneering work of a child psychologist I'm sure many of you are aware of by the name of Jean Piaget. Piaget had what was, I think, possibly one of the most interesting jobs in the world. Uh, more than 100 years ago, he spent most of his academic life watching children playing. Now today he'd be arrested for that job, of course, <laughs> but fortunately at that time he was able to make some really interesting observations. And one of his observations, which was very odd at the time he wrote, was his idea that maybe children are born different. Maybe from the time they're born, children are actually hardwired to have different preferences for interacting in the world. One of the things that he noticed, for example, was that some children are like this when it comes to mommy and daddy. And if mommy moves, I'm moving too. I become very uncomfortable when I, I'm not close to mommy or daddy. Other kids are like, yeah, see you later. <laughs> they just honestly didn't care. Even two children from the same family. If you, have, you yourself have two or more children, I am sure that you have contemplated this with your spouse or partner at some point where you go, well, we've got two or more children, and how could they be so different? Like, they both are from the same genetic material. They are from the same genetic material, right? Okay. Um, 
how could, how could they have become so different from one another? And while Piaget didn't have an answer to that, his observation that actually we have hardwired differences in the way that we want to interact in our world was the starting point of what would eventually become learning styles theory. The next person that sort of picked up this ball was a German psychologist by the name of Hans Eysenck. And Eysenck proposed the idea of something that he called the optimal arousal state. The optimal arousal state is that point in your environment where your internal need for external stimulation is perfectly matched by the external stimulation that you're experiencing. So for example, for some of you, all of this might just be too much. Like, was this an undergraduate psychology lecture? What's going on? Uh, and there just might be too much stimulation. For others of you, uh, this is not enough stimulation. You want me to be juggling balls while swallowing fire and have flashy <laughs> graphics that are shining all over the place. Finding the right balance of what stimulates you is really important. Let me give you another example. How many of you, when you were taking your biochemistry course and learning Krebs cycle, used to like to have the radio or a television or some kind of distraction on? Put up your hand if you were that kind of a person. How many of you would have killed that person if they were your roommate? <laughs> For those people who like the radio on, the, the content of biochemistry was simply not stimulating enough to keep you engaged. You needed more. Ising called those people extroverts. The idea being that they need external stimulation to bring them up to a level of optimal arousal or optimal engagement in their world. If we fast forward to today, these and other theories have sort of been woven together to give us this insight that perhaps we are all different. We actually have different internalized, hardwired uh, psychologies that suggest that we need different things to interact most effectively in our world. This is where learning styles theory begins, and this is also where your work begins. This is the signal to hand out the handout. In a moment, you're going to be receiving at your tables something called a health professional's inventory of learning styles. It's sort of like a handy dandy Cosmo quiz um, that asks you to answer about 19 questions, 17 questions, and in the process, hopefully, you'll start to learn something a little bit more about yourself as a learner and perhaps where your hardwired learning preferences are. As you receive this handout, take a few minutes and to complete the tool. This is not a test that you actually need to like, you know, cheat on or anything. There's no <laughs> point in looking at your neighbor's answers. Spill this out to the best of your abilities, and in a few minutes we'll discuss what this might mean for you as a person, but also for your work as an educator. Okay, so some of you are finished, some of you aren't. If you're not finished, keep on going. If you are finished and want something else to do, I'll just make a couple of comments about what, you're, what the activity that you're doing. It's actually really interesting for me as an observer to watch people complete this instrument because simply watching you do this starts to give me some insights into your learning styles. So for example, some of you actually read the instructions. <laughs> what? I just a whole bunch of you, what? There were instructions? No, 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 no. I'm a graduate educated university student. As soon as I see questions, I just answer them. But some of you actually read it because the very first instruction was to ask you to reflect and think about something. But some of you, by gosh, there were questions to answer. You were going to answer them. Some of you agonized over what's the difference between hardly and seldom. Like, oh no, I, I, are you talking 12% of the time or 17.65% of the time? Others of you were like, boop, 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 boop. 
one person, as soon as the paper landed at his or her station, the pen came out, shh, they finished, and the first thing you did was go, yeah, I finished first. <laughs> USA, USA. <laughs> Again, the way you approach an activity like this starts to reveal some insights into your temperaments, your preferences, your personality, your emotional intelligence, but ultimately your learning style. The theory behind this instrument is uh, David Kolb's learning styles theory. And Kolb was one of the first ones to suggest that learning is actually a two-step process. When we learn, we have to first take in information from the outside world. In a sort of oversimplification, there are two predominant ways we can take in information from the outside world. Some of us like to take in information from the outside world by watching by reading, by observing. And others of us like to take in information from the outside world by actually doing something. By, for example, if you have to assemble a barbecue, do you actually read the instruction manual or just say, there's parts, <laughs> let's just go and, and try it. And trial and error is your predominant way of taking information in from the outside world. Once you've taken in information from the outside world, you have to do something with it cognitively. And once again, there are two primary ways we process information. One way is by thinking, reflecting, rehearsing, and practicing. Others of us, we need to process information by immediately applying, doing, and putting into action. When you intersect these two processes, you end up with four different potential learning styles. And that's what this instrument is meant to diagnose. Now, a word, all of you are, of course, successful, competent human beings, which means that you may not have had a single learning style that dominated. Most likely, you may have been on a boundary. You may have had two dominant learning styles, or a learning style that were you know, only one point apart. This is not rocket science, and this is not blood typing. This is not a definitive diagnosis. It's meant to be a tool to promote self-reflection about you as a learner. So for the purposes of today, if you had a tie or your numbers were close, what I'd ask you to do is simply flip the page over, and most of you did this already because, of course, if there's questions, there's answers, and I want the answers. Take a look at the brief paragraph descriptions of each of the four learning styles, and if you're closer, it's a tie, for the rest of today, simply pick the description that you think is the best approximation for who you are as a learner. And once you've done that, what I'm going to ask you to do next is to publicly disclose in front of all of your colleagues and friends <laughs> what your dominant learning style actually is. So with that, I'm going to ask, how many of you in the room are divergers? Put up your hand if that was your dominant learning style. How many of you were assimilators? Put up your hand. How many of you were convergers? Put up your hand. How many of you were accommodators? Put up your hand. Okay, so statisticians call this freakish distribution because <laughs> in a normally, a typical population, you'd have about a quarter in each quadrant, but of course you are all highly educated healthcare professionals, so you are freakish. You are not a typical population, and so it's no surprise that we tended to congregate in two styles, assimilators and convergers. What I'd like you to do now, in order to think a little bit more about this now it applies to you, is spend some time with the people of your own kind. In a moment, I'm going to ask all the divergers to go to this corner, all of the assimilators to come here, all the, all the convergers to come here, and all the uh, accommodators to go to that corner. And when you move to your corner for a few minutes, oh, just a second, in a few moments, I'm gonna ask you to answer two questions. The first question is, figure out what you might have in common with one another, either socially or professionally. And secondly, discuss with one another the answer to the question, how did you learn how to drive? Psychologists love how I learned to drive stories because there are few things in life, in North American life at least, that are as common as driving. Virtually every adult learns how to drive. There are few things in life that are actually as cognitively complex as driving. Think about making a left-hand turn on a hill in a manual transmission car. Because you are 
coordinating every limb in your body simultaneously. <laughs> you were making a whole bunch of micro judgments, gas, clutch, is it safe to turn, is it not safe to turn? And if you make a mistake, you could die. <laughs> and equally, there is no association between intelligence and driving skills. Because I'm sure there are some people in this room who are incredibly smart and are terrible drivers and would happily never drive again if they could avoid it. And there are lots of people out there, or maybe in this room, who are dumb as posts and who are amazingly good drivers. So in a moment, I'll ask you to go to your corners, divergers, assimilators, convergers, and accommodators. If you had a tie and you're still not sure which style you are, just pick one for the purposes of the discussion now and go to it and answer those two questions. And in a few minutes, I'm going to ask representatives from each group to share their discussions. Divergers, assimilators, convergers, accommodators. OK, just another minute or so to finish up your conversations. And if a few of you could prepare yourself psychologically to present some of your group's discussions to everybody else, that would be grand. So, which group would like to present their stories around what they have in common and how they learned how to drive to the rest of the world first? What did you have in common with one another and how did you each learn how to drive? So the can you hear me? Yeah. So what we have in common, um, I think none of us really conform to typical kinds of leadership or learning styles and so sort of adapt based on what's happening around us. Um, driving, one sort of delayed learning to drive and the rest of us went to an empty parking lot and drove around in circles until okay. we learned how to drive and then went out on the roads. Okay. So <laughs> the way you learned to drive was you drove. We drove, yes. Okay, okay. So Without a, anybody else around. Without, okay, so just a couple of <laughs> observations. First of all, you will notice that this is by far the smallest group in the room. And as you'll find out in a few moments, post-secondary education and the professional workforce is strangely unkind to accommodators. And it's absolutely not a coincidence that there's so few of you here. You are truly the survivors of the story. <laughs> One of the other things that uh, I noticed in observation is of all of the groups, despite the abundance of hundreds of chairs, they were the only ones that sat down. Everybody else stood around, but they were like, well, why are we standing? <laughs> Let's just sit down. And again, that's an important cue as to some of the internal motivation and psychology that may dominate for accommodators. Let's give our accommodators a round of applause. Which group would like to go next and present themselves? Go ahead. So convergers. So as a good converger, I only spoke with Karen okay. the entire time. <laughs> and we talked about driving. Mm -hmm. And Karen felt that she really learned how to drive when she finally learned a stick to do a standard and um, learned with her now husband. And I just went to driving school for four sun Saturdays, got my license, and then didn't drive for four years. And okay. That was my story. Okay, so in terms of driving stories, again, what you see is this almost cavalier approach to it. <laughs> the way you learn to drive is to drive. As we'll probably hear from this side of the room, you should get nowhere near these people if you're trying to teach them how to drive <laughs> because your teaching style may be toxic to their learning style. <laughs> Let's hear from this side of the room. Uh, divergers or assimilators, what were some of your How I Learned to Drive stories? A uh, theme with divergers was this idea that we, we were all very anxious to drive and uh, jumped into lessons and then got our license. It okay. Was, uh, we, we, were, we were just eager to do it and we all wanted to do it. Uh, a couple of us were a little trepidatious but jumped into lessons seemed to be the primary vehicle. And as soon as we got the lessons, we got our license right away. Okay, so lessons. There was some talk of lessons over here but it was sort of almost dismissed. Like sort of like, I did four Saturdays. These people didn't even bother with lessons. <laughs> they were out there breaking the law, driving at the age of like 12 or whatever it was around parking lots. <laughs> but this notion of lessons, of perhaps structure, of observation, of per and a word that's generally important to this half of the room is this notion of rehearsal in safe and controlled circumstances. What about our assimilators? What could we learn about learning styles from our assimilators? 
other than the fact that none of them want to speak. <laughs> There's like 42,000 of you, so one, of, one of you. Oh, there we go. You get to be second in line for lunch. Um, so just realizing actually we had more in common than, um, than we realized. All three of us put off learning to drive, so we didn't learn at the age of 16. Mm -hmm. Several years after that, um, all had some challenging experiences with our family members who taught it, who tried to teach us how to drive. Those people, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and then a couple of us wound up having to absolutely take lessons okay. um, in order to learn. Good. Yeah. Did any of you learn how to drive by reading the manual? And by that, I don't mean the 365 or whatever it's called, the permit manual, but actually the manual of the car. Okay, because I've actually heard that several times from strong assimilators that before they started learning to drive, they actually got the book that comes with the car that says, here's how to roll down the windows. And, and they actually would start to read something like that. What you're actually hearing again from this side in particular is this notion that structure, rehearsal, doing it in my own time. Just because I turned 16, don't force me into doing things. I will get there, but you need to give me time to get there. Which, if you are strongly rooted in this corner, might start to cause impatience. Like, I'm not asking you to split the atom here. Just like, put your foot down and look ahead. <laughs> Why is this so difficult? OK, well, thank you to all four of our groups. If I could ask you to take your seats again. Now, the reality for all of you as teachers, of course, is that there's going to be situations and circumstances where you get a new learner, a student, and you are going to get on like a house on fire. You are going to love them. They're going to love you. It's going to be bang, 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 bang. You're going to think this is the greatest job in the world. And then there are other times where you get somebody who might be really sweet, really kind, but you're just not connecting. That something isn't going the way you want it to go. You find yourself biting your tongue, wondering if this person is right for your field, and it just becomes exhausting. Learning styles theory potentially provides us with, if not an explanation, at least a vocabulary to start to describe what happens when teaching relationships go well and sometimes when they don't. And it comes down to nothing more complicated than the fact that we have different ways of taking in information from the outside world and different ways of processing it once we do. In the next few moments, I'm going to present what learning styles literature tells us about the arch stereotypes of each of these four learning styles. None of you will conform 100% to these stereotypes, but they might be useful just to think about how these four quadrants intersect with one another. Let's start with what might be a useful summary statement for each of the learning styles. For divergers, what might summarize uh, divergers best is the sentence, Let's just all get along, OK? Because the thing that is most top of mind for strong divergers is harmony. Divergers have a really hard time working in very political, gossip-oriented, backstabbing environments. What they really need in order to succeed is for people to have fun, to get along, and to feel a sense of camaraderie. Now, in the interest of disclosure, I should tell you that, that I am actually quite a strong diverger. And so actually divergers are the right learning style and all the best looking people are divergers. <laughs> this notion though that divergers need harmony before they can even get to learning is really, really crucial. And you'll see it's not necessarily what other learning styles need. For assimilators, if there was one sentence that would summarize assimilators, it might be, lack of organization on your part is no reason for an emergency <laughs> on my part. Of all the learning styles, what assimilators need in their environment is not necessarily interpersonal harmony, but organizational structure. If you are a strong assimilator, you might have liked those learning objectives I flashed up at the beginning of the session for you. You actually want things to be organized, systematic, and logical. And when things aren't that way, it's hard for you to learn. Let me give you uh, an example. I'll, I'll, use, I'll use my own profession of pharmacy. Let's say Amy has a pharmacy student who's with her uh, for a rotation. And if Amy is a strong assimilator as a, uh, as a are, you, are you an assimilator? No, I'm a converger. Well, good for you. Marching to the beat of a different drummer. So let's say Amy is a strong converger. Her tendency is going to be 
to want to jump in and do things. How do you learn to drive? You drive. So what she might do when her student comes and says, oh, Billy, great, I'm so glad you're in the pharmacy today. Okay, we're gonna go counsel a, a new patient on use of a Ventolin inhaler. Go. And she might think, great, I'm gonna put them right into it, they're gonna learn how to do it, it's all going to be fine. But if that student is a strong assimilator and values organization, they may go, but I just got here. Uh, you didn't tell me I was going to have to counsel on a Ventolin inhaler right now. If you told me I was going to do that, I would have read up on beta agonists. I would have uh, read the patient information leaflet. I would have practiced in front of the mirror. I would have practiced with my mother a few times, and then I would be perfectly ready to go. Amy might look at her student and go, what's wrong with you? All I'm asking you to do is go talk to somebody about an inhaler. I'm gonna be right there, it's not that difficult. I'm not asking you to figure out Brexit or anything like that. <laughs> I'm just asking you to talk about an inhaler. You know, because sometimes as a pharmacist or a healthcare professional, you're gonna to need to be able to think on your feet. You're gonna to need to be able to roll with the punches. Maybe pharmacy is not the right field for you. You flip it around. Had Amy happened to have been a strong assimilator, her approach might have been, welcome to the rotation, Billy. Here's the policy and procedure manual for the department. I want you to just go through this. In the event of bomb threat, here's what you're supposed to do. Here's all our policy and procedures. Next Tuesday, we're going to be counseling a patient on how to use their Ventolin inhaler. Here's some information about uh, beta agonists. Here's some patient information leaflets. We'll practice a couple of times, and then we'll be ready to go next Tuesday. And if the student happened to be a strong converger, they might say, kill me now. <laughs> How hard is this to do? Why are you making me read all of this stuff and practice? It's not that hard. And now Amy, as a strong assimilator, maybe looks at the student and goes, what's wrong with you? Yeah, I know it's only an inhaler, but it's a real human being we're talking about. You have to get it right. Why are you so cocky and arrogant as to think that you can do this on your own? Why are you so unwilling to learn by reading? Maybe pharmacy is not the field for you. <laughs> In essence, what's happened here, of course, is you simply have people with different learning styles approaching the same situation. But rather than saying, oh, I see, you are an assimilator and you exist at the intersection of reflection and introspection and I'm a converger and I ex exist at the intersection of, of action and, and doing, we start to say things like, maybe this field isn't right for you. The convergers exist in a more action-oriented plane. And if there's a sentence that summarizes convergers, it may be, relax everyone, I'm here to help. Now, not to tell tales out of school, but I did, I did find out that one person in the room whose job description rhymes with the letters B, D, Zo, <laughs> in completing this inventory, confided to me that, oh, I, I'm a converger, oh great. Well, I didn't have time to answer the questions. I just flipped over and said, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> and then walked over. <laughs> there could be nothing more convergent than that <laughs> behavior. Because convergers have, at their best, a sense of self-confidence, a sense of, let's just do it. How do you learn how to drive? Well, you drive. What's this lessons business? Just, just, just go and do it. I, they, you know, stop talking about it, just go ahead and do it. Convergers, especially amongst healthcare professionals, tend to actually gravitate to leadership positions because to themselves they have a certain amount of confidence, but to others, particularly assimilators, they have this breathtaking sense of competence. That, wow, you would just stand up and do this? That's amazing. You must be a leader. Go ahead, become a CEO. At their best, what convergers like to do, like you know, the, the, the most well-intentioned convergers at least, what they like to do is cut through the chaos, cut through the disorganization, and actually rise to the occasion. And this starts to become a bit of a potential conflict between strong assimilators and strong convergers. Because strong assimilators have a deep suspicion that there's never a reason for chaos. Chaos is always because other people aren't doing their job. While actually convergers need some chaos in order to demonstrate their leadership skills. They actually thrive on a bit of chaos and can sometimes construct chaos 
in order to shine. And this can sometimes, I'll be leaving in 15 minutes, good luck to you. Um, <laughs> and this can sometimes be a potential source of conflict, both in organizations, but of course in teaching and learning situations. And of course we have forgotten our long-suffering accommodators, those three woeful individuals who at least <laughs> took a seat. Because if there's a sentence that summarizes accommodators, it might be, are we there yet? Why are we still talking about this? Couldn't we have done this in 10 minutes? At their best, what accommodators do is get stuff done. They have this real interest and need to stop yakety yakking, don't burden me with policies and procedures, let's just get work done. And so they're the people that actually do stuff. But unfortunately, at their worst, the strongest accommodators can sometimes be so interested in getting stuff done fast that they might be a little bit more flexible when it comes to getting stuff done well. <laughs> when we look at each of the learning styles, one of the things that you will see is that when it comes to the substance of learning, individuals have different needs. I'll speak as a st relatively strong diverger, and I will tell you that when I was in pharmacy school, my favorite subject is a subject that Amy never took because it doesn't exist anymore as a subject that we teach. We used to take a whole, half, uh, whole semester course back in the 1980s in something called the history of pharmacy. And it was basically a history course. And it turned out to be my favorite and best course, not because I particularly care about or was interested in history, but because I loved the guy who taught it. He was weird and quirky and eccentric and pleasant and just such a nice person. And because I connected to him as a person, I connected to the content. I will tell you that the thing that I did worst at when I was a student was antiarrhythmic drugs, which are complicated drugs to learn, but the guy who taught it in pharmacology was a jerk face. <laughs> he was the type, that old school kind of teacher who would walk around the room and just go, literally, flecanide. Because I disliked him, I disliked the content, and consequently never learned anything about antiarrhythmic drugs to punish him for it. <laughs> if you are a strong diverger, your greatest asset is that you teach with everything you've got. You've probably noticed already that for me, the way I just can't help but thinking about teaching is that if they like me, then they'll listen. If they like me, they'll like the material. And so what that means is you put a lot of personality into teaching because that's what you want your teachers to do. You can be crushed though as a diverger because if people don't like your content, you suddenly start to think they don't like you. And that can be a problem for strong divergers. For assimilators, that's not the case. Personality is all well and good, but what assimilators like is substance. They actually value theory and expertise. They like people that have lots of letters after their names. They like individuals who they think are smarter than them who are teaching them. And in some fields, particularly where, for example, your degree might have changed. You might have graduated with a bachelor's degree in your field, and now all of a sudden everybody coming out of school has a master's degree in your field. And for strong assimilators, that can be a problem because, well, I have a master's degree, and yeah, I'm younger than you, but you only have a bachelor's degree. Why are you teaching me? That just doesn't seem right for some reason. Theory, expertise, organization, learning objectives, logic, those are the things that motivate and drive assimilators to have things be learn-worthy. What the convergers like? Utility. They actually want things that they, they don't just give me a whole bunch of yakety yak theory, actually tell me what I can do with this. I need to actually be able to apply what I'm using. Don't give me readings and stuff like that that is just all filled with mumbo jumbo. What I want is practical application. The strong assimilator goes, but yeah, you can't do, you have to learn how to walk before you can run. You have to learn about beta agonists before you can talk about Ventolin inhalers. And conversion goes, no I don't. No I don't, really, I can talk about Ventolin inhalers and not know anything about how they work. That's sort of the school of thought of like Donald Trump as president, for example. <laughs> and accommodators take that instinct towards application and utility one step further. One of the problems that we tend to have in post-secondary education is that if you were a group of academics, if you were working in universities, 
about 80% of you would be assimilators. Assimilators get rewarded in school because teachers at universities are assimilators. But especially if you are an accommodator, you are at daggers drawn to the dominant teaching style in university, which is very text heavy, very recall intensive, very organized in that kind of a way. So then what do we want from our teachers for each of the learning styles? Well, if you're a diverger, you actually want a friend. If you're an assimilator, you want an expert. If you're a converger, what you want is a coach in that sort of athletic sense of the word, the kind of person who goes, pick up your sorry butt and get going. Oh well, yeah, I'll show you. And if you're an accommodator, you might not even want a teacher. You just want somebody who's there, and if you have a question, you'll ask them, but don't, don't get all in my face with all of your know-it-all stuff. I kind of know what I'm doing here. How do the different learning styles relate to one another? Let's say uh, in my day job at the university, I give a group assignment. And after the group assignment is handed in, I ask students, tell me how everything went with your group work. A strong diverger might say, oh, the group was really great. We're still all friends. <laughs> Did you learn anything? Did you get the assignment done? Did you get an A? What's most important is that we're all still friends. Now there, of course, is a time and a place where harmony is an essential attribute of any organization. And within a group, divergers are oftentimes your best people to smooth out ruffled feathers, to jolly people along, to keep things sliding along nicely. But sometimes they can so overvalue the need for people to get along that it crushes them. In contrast, what might assimilators say? How do assimilators relate to one another? It's the exact opposite of how convergers relate to one another. For assimilators, they may confuse other people's confidence with competence, while for convergers, they may mistake their own confidence for competence. <laughs> Those two words are really similar sounding, but we all know that competence and confidence should be different things. For the strongest assimilators, there is a tendency to be extraordinarily hard on yourself. And being overly self-critical is a big problem for strong assimilators. They always think that there is something more or better they should do. To put it gently, strong convergers are not burdened by that issue. Let me give you an example. Let's say I give a test and there is a, a student, th they've done their work, they think they've done well, and they end up, let's say, getting a 70 on it. And they thought they should get more. A strong diverger who wonders why I only got a 70 on a test is likely never going to come and talk to me about it. Why? Because the mortification of actually showing my face to you, it's a, now you know I only got a 70, you know, don't care about the mark. I, I just don't want to be embarrassed because I want you to be my friend. In contrast, a strong assimilator might do something like this. Um, sorry, uh, can I bother you? I don't have a point. Is it okay if I bother you? Uh, okay. you know, I'm not complaining about the mark. I'm really not, but you know, I did all the homework, I did all the readings, I did the problem sets, I came to every lecture, I thought I did everything, I only got a, I'm not complaining about the mark, but I just don't understand, why did I only get a 70? For assimilators, there is a belief that if you follow the rules, a predictable positive outcome will result. And when that doesn't happen, it's really not about the mark, it's about my world is being rocked a bit here because I did what I was supposed to do, why didn't it work out? In contrast, a strong converger who only got 70 on a test, and this has happened to me many times, but Amy wasn't one of the people that this happened to, <laughs> they'll actually come into my office and go, hey, yeah, I only got 70 on the test. There's something wrong with your test. <laughs> they don't mean anything negative by it. You're the teacher, therefore it's your test. I only got 70, I am far more confident and competent than that, ergo, <laughs> there is something wrong with your test. In contrast, a strong accommodator tends to value efficiency, sometimes at the expense of quality or efficacy. And so a strong accommodator would go, I got 70 on the test. Hey, C's get degrees, 6-0 and go. 
Nobody is ever going to worry about, I got 70 on your midterm exam. Who cares? Let's just all move on. These little examples, I hope, start to illustrate how many different consequences there are for how our internalized hardwiring around learning style can shape our interactions with one another, our learning environment, and most importantly, our teachers. If we don't pay sufficient attention to learning style, it's so easy for us to misconstrue or start to think things like, oh, maybe pharmacy's not right for you. We know that bosses hire people that remind them of themselves, managers promote people that remind them of themselves, and teachers cannot help but think that the best students are the students that remind them of themselves, that learn in the same way they do. The point of learning styles theory is that there is not a right or best way to learn, and that what we need to do is not just be respectful of different learning styles, but understand how we can help people who have different learning styles to achieve their best. Not by changing their learning style, but by actually helping them to excel in the way that they are. The final thing I'll point out is what's the approach to feedback, because feedback is essential to effective instruction. Let's say I am Amy's student and I have counseled my patient on salbutamol inhaler. As a strong diverger who values interpersonal relationships, what do I want my preceptor to say to me? That was fantastic. You were so good. Did you see how you made that patient laugh? You did that really well. By the way, you forgot to say remove the uh, cap before you use the <laughs> inhaler, but you'll get that the next time. You're the best. We love having you here. You may recognize that as the sandwich method of feedback. And that works very effectively for divergers because they need face saving to ensure that you still like me. Okay, I'll tell them to take the cap off, but everything is good. Assimilators don't necessarily need that. What assimilators need is clarity. What drives assimilators crazy about feedback is when someone tells them, that was good, or yeah, that was okay. What assimilators want is to say, you counseled this patient on Ventolin, there are 10 things that you need to educate every patient upon. You did nine of those things, therefore it was excellent. Here are the criteria upon which you're being judged. You knew them in advance. This is exactly what you needed. I was assessing you. You got nine out of these, therefore that equals excellent. It's not this vague, that was good, or that was okay. It's specific, it's focused, and it's believable because it's criterion based. Convergers don't need that level of detail. Because convergers tend to be a little bit competitive and rise to the occasion when people start to put them down a bit, a converger may respond well to feedback that says, oh, you just counted on the Ventolin? You forgot to say take the cap off. You don't need to like stroke my ego and say, that was fantastic, blah, 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 blah. And finally, what do accommodators generally need from you? Oh yeah, you counseled, that was fine. Because for accommodators, they have an internalized sense of, oh yeah, I forgot to say take the lid off. You don't have to keep reminding me about it and talking about it. There's no point in going on and on about it. Now you might see that there's a potential problem here. Because if I am a strong diverger and my student is a strong accommodator and the student wants to hear good and what I'm saying is, that was fantastic, that was the best ever, you're the blah, 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 blah. The strong accommodator student is going, you need to take a Valium because you're way too hyper. <laughs> in contrast, if I have an accommodator who is my preceptor, and I need to hear, that was fantastic, that was the best ever, and all I hear was, good, in my mind, that equals crap. <laughs> we deliver feedback the way we want to hear feedback, but we don't do it in a way that our students need and would benefit most from feedback. And understanding learning styles can perhaps shape that uh, conversation. So where do you go with all of this? At this point, somebody oftentimes thinks, well, maybe I'm a strong converger, I should only take converger students. <laughs> That's not a good idea. First of all, this 17 item instrument is nowhere near solid enough to make vast social engineering decisions like that. <laughs> but more importantly, the point is all of us need to learn from others. And we don't live in societies where we segregate people based on learning style. Instead, what we need to do is simply understand and respect that we might be coming from different places as teacher and learner. You're welcome to use this tool as a way of opening a conversation with your learners about what you like to do as a teacher and what they like to do as a student. But at the end of the day, what I usually suggest is that you're the teacher, you have all the power, meet your student at their front door, teach to their learning style first, 
but over the course of a rotation, bring them to your front door. Help them to learn how to expand their repertoire of learning in order to be more effective and adaptable. Ultimately then, the whole point of this is not to engineer teaching relationships, but of course to think about ways of improving them, mainly through reflecting on you. You as the single most important variable you can control, and that you can actually potentially think about alternative ways of managing your relationships with learners more effectively. And so to end, I'd ask you to think a little bit about these three re reflection questions. How does your learning style influence your perception of a great teacher or student or a lousy teacher of student? How do the educational programs you're in actually explicitly try to address different learning styles needs? You may have noticed as we talked about this, I actually tried to do that with this session. There was some hardcore theory for the assimilators in the room. There was a lot of getting up and walking around for the convergers and the accommodators in the room. There were some laughs for the divergers in the room. Specifically thinking about what can you do to target all kinds of learners can be really, really helpful. That's it, and if you're interested in some more readings, there's some ideas. Thank you so much for your attendance and your active participation. That was one of the most fun learning sessions I've had. The most fun learning session. <laughs> <laughs> I've ever had. I like the hands. Yeah. Um, we actually have a break outside, but I think we have time for two quick questions. Uh, any questions? Sean. So the question is, when you are in a large group session, you've got different sort of multiple learning styles in your room, are you just overwhelmed by all of that? Or do you actually use it as an opportunity to try this stuff and, and diversify your teaching practices to reach those learning styles? At the end of the room, it's helpful for me to remember that I've got all the power. It's, so, so, so that allows me to be generous and say, it's not about what I would like to do as a teacher, it's about what is going to resonate for a mixed group of individuals. It's not as complicated as it might sound to just consciously think about, right, what's something I can do for the divergers? What's something I can do for the same? And even if you just do one or two things in a session that explicitly targets the learning strengths of those different learning styles, it can make a world of difference for the individual student and just really open up a classroom for you. Are there generational changes in learning styles? Great question. I would actually say most likely yes, but I don't know that anybody's actually been able to quantify it just yet. What is uh, fairly clear is that in a weird way, especially in primary and secondary education, what we're seeing is a very bimodal split in what is rewarded in schools. Historically, assimilators ruled formal education. But what's happening now is convergency is becoming so much more prominent. So by the time they're in kindergarten, students are working in groups and doing PowerPoint presentations and you know, doing, like, they're doing all of this stuff that's very outward facing. Um, the people that are really being left behind a lot right now I worry about are accommodators and divergers. Partly because unfortunately harmony, nobody seems to care about harmony in education anymore. There's such a focus on outcomes and competency statements and things like that. And accommodators, and especially the learnings of accommodators, are really getting short shrift, particularly in primary school. And that potentially can be a problem. Yep, so there's some, uh, the question is, can people's learning styles evolve or shift over time? So, this, so the whole idea of learning style theory itself is somewhat controversial, because as some of you probably already figured out, in one context I might be a diverger, but with other people I might be an accommodator. So there's, there's criticism of this as a theory, that somehow this is a fixed, I, like a fixed entity. The proponents of learning style theory, though, would suggest that uh, the answer to your question is actually the answer to the question of neuroplasticity. 
And sort of at what point do we just basically, does the jelly in our brain turn into rock solid iron bars? What most learning styles theorists would tell you, by the time you're about 25 or 30, your learning styles are probably more fixed and less adaptable. There's a really interesting thing that actually didn't come up today in terms of the notion of professions and uh, learning styles. So having done this session for uh, many years, one of, the thing, one of my observations is that it's fairly clear to me that certain professions cluster in certain learning styles. So for example, about 60 to 70% of pharmacists are assimilators. Paradoxically, about 60 to 70% of family physicians are convergers. About 60 to 70% of psychotherapists are divergers. And about 60 to 70% of surgeons and technologists, and strangely enough, hairdressers, <laughs> people that use scissors, <laughs> are accommodators. And that starts to raise an intriguing question for the Harry Potter fans out there among you. Does the wand pick the wizard, or does the wizard pick the wand? Are you drawn to your field because there is a culture of convergence or assimilation in that field? Or do you adapt your own learning style because now you're in that environment? Well, I, I wish we could keep going on. I think we, we could keep you here all morning. But we do have a program to continue. So on behalf of everyone, thank you so much, Dr. Austin.